It is May 334 BC. As the sun rose over the Hellespont, Alexander the Great stood atop the cliffs overlooking the Granicus River, his army arrayed behind him. At that moment, he knew that on these battlefields the fate of his campaign against the Persian Empire would be decided. He had arrived in Asia Minor just months earlier, leading his army across the Hellespont. He was determined to conquer the mighty Persian Empire and claim his rightful place as ruler of the known world. And now, as he gazed down upon the gathering Persian forces, he knew that his first great test had come. Alexander the Great's scouts warned him that the Persian army was nearby. Tracking the enemy was a fundamental asset to any ancient army. However, individual anonymity was much more secure in the past. Plenty of institutions track your data and browsing history nowadays. That is why I want to talk about today's sponsor, Atlas VPN. They are running a special discount offering you a 3-year subscription for just $1.99 per month. Atlas VPN ensures all online traffic is encrypted, meaning nobody will be able to track what you do online. But Atlas VPN does much more. Your Google searches remain private, ads and malware are blocked. It warns you when someone tries to steal your data, and you can protect unlimited devices with your subscription. Visit the link on screen or in the description. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount. It means you can get a 3-year subscription for just $1.99 a month with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Time is running out, so get your deal by clicking the link in the video description below. Philip, king of Macedon, was a skilled and ambitious military leader, determined to expand his kingdom. In 338 BC, he subdued the Greek city-states at the iconic Battle of Chaeronea, forcing them into an alliance known as the League of Corinth. Nothing stood in the way of his personal ambitious goal, the invasion and the conquest of the mighty Achaemenid Empire to his east. The Persian Empire, ruled by Darius III, was one of the largest and most powerful empires the world had ever seen. It stretched from modern-day Greece and Turkey in the west to India in the east. The Persians were known for their wealth and their powerful army. They were also known for their impressive system of roads and communication, which allowed them to move troops and supplies across their vast territory quickly. Philip spent countless hours training his levied soldiers and building a powerful navy to support his campaign. But the evening before the invasion, he was murdered by his bodyguard, Pausanias, a custom not too rare in Macedonia's brutal court politics. The assassin was slain almost directly after the murder. Philip's death sent shockwaves through the kingdom, leaving his ambitious expansion plan in ruins. His young, energetic and ambitious son Alexander succeeded him. He was just 20 years old when he inherited the throne. Despite his youth, Alexander was already a seasoned warrior and skilled strategist, having served as one of his father's top generals and accompanying him on many campaigns. He gained military experience during the Battle of Chaeronea, commanding the cavalry and delivering the flanking maneuver which decided the battle in Macedon's favor. Upon taking the throne, he faced a difficult task of consolidating his power and maintaining control over the kingdom. It wasn't just instability at court either. Because upon learning of Philip's death, subjugated city-states in the Hellenic League revolted. Assuming the young king was too inexperienced and indecisive about maintaining Macedon's position, the enterprising king surprised many when he executed potential rivals for the throne. He brutally beat down rebellions among city-states and northern regions which rose up against him. Thebes, the dominant Greek power after they defeated Sparta at the 371 Battle of Leuctra, was among the most vocal city-states rebelling. Alexander swiftly crushed their uprising and decided to make an example out of them. After a brief siege, he razed the city to the ground and sold its population into slavery. Athens initially schemed with Thebes to revolt, but eventually submitted itself to Alexander. This move prevented its complete destruction. 
Despite these challenges, Alexander was determined to continue with his father's plans for expansion and conquest. Just like his father, he looked to the east. His motivation was supposedly to punish the Persians for the destruction they had wrought over Greece a century earlier. But in reality, Asia Minor was ideal for colonization since Greece was getting overpopulated. Additionally, Alexander was driven by pure ambition. He compared his journey towards Asia Minor to the legendary Greek expedition to Troy. Throughout his life, his conduct would be influenced by contemporary heroic norms of honor, prestige, and courage. By the spring of 334 BC, after dealing with the internal turmoil for two years, Alexander was ready to launch an invasion into Persia. As he approached his 22nd year, Alexander found himself at the head of an army of seasoned soldiers, ready to conquer the world. At his side were his most trusted companions, men who had fought by his side for years and shared his dreams of glory. In spring, Alexander marched from Pella through Thrace towards the Hellespont. He left behind General Antipater with 12,000 infantry and 15,000 cavalry to defend the kingdom. He knew that he would face many challenges. The army he took numbered around 35,000 infantry and 5,000 cavalry. Diodorus estimates the army was composed of 12,000 Macedonians, 7,000 allies and 5,000 mercenaries commanded by Permenian. Illyrians, Trebalians and Odrysians made up another 7,000 soldiers and around 1,000 were archers. Philetus, son of Parmenian, commanded 1,800 Macedonian heavy cavalry. 1,800 Thessalians were commanded by Callus, son of Harpalus. Within three weeks, Alexander reached the Hellespont. Using his fleet of around 160 ships, his army crossed it unopposed. That was Alexander's fortune, for the Persian fleet numbered at least 400 Phoenician triremes. After crossing the Hellespont, he moved south. His advance force, commanded by Permenian and Natalis, met heavy resistance. But once the initial resistance was dealt with, Alexander was greeted by the Ionian cities, which had long chafed under Persian rule. They had suffered greatly under the yoke of their oppressors. But now, as Alexander approached with his army, they saw a chance for freedom and liberation. They threw open their gates to the young conqueror, welcoming him as a liberator and a savior. The Macedonian commander forbade his men to loot the region, reasoning it was now their land. The western satraps learned of Alexander's invasion. They gathered forces from all around the region to stop the Macedonian advance in its tracks. Memnon of Rhodes, a Greek mercenary in Persian service, suggested evading the Macedonians. He knew their supply lines were unstable, and Alexander did not have enough funds to keep his men happy. Instead, he suggested the Persian army should use scorched earth tactics to make Alexander's advance impossible and use the enormous Persian fleet to transport his army and invade Macedonia. Persian commanders disagreed. Many considered avoiding battle and circumventing the enemy dishonorable. They decided to meet Alexander's army in battle. Around May, nearby the Granicus River in Asia Minor, the armies met. Alexander's army numbered between 20,000 and 25,000 soldiers, 12,000 heavy infantry, phalangites and hippaspists. His heavy cavalry numbered around 4,500 troops and his light cavalry another 900 to 1,000. The remainder of his force consisted of light infantry. His scouts warned him the Persian army was nearby and had taken up position on the other bank of the river Granicus. Upon this information, the king immediately deployed his army. The core of his army consisted of the fabled Macedonian phalanx. With their long pikes, these infantry troops could ideally absorb frontal charges. Alexander generally rode among his heavy cavalry. These were meant to charge into the weak spots in the enemy lines. Parmenian commanded the left flank, consisting of Greek and Thracian infantry and cavalry. Philetus commanded the companion cavalry on the far right, and Parmenian the cavalry on the left. The strategic problem must have immediately been apparent. 
the river Granicus was sunk in a channel below steeply rising banks. The satrap's army was larger than Alexander's force. It numbered 20,000 infantry, many of which were Greek mercenaries, and 20,000 cavalry. They deployed on the east bank of the Granicus River. Memnon of Rhodes commanded the cavalry position to the far left. Svetidrates and Mitridates commanded their center and right cavalry flank respectively. Their fabled Persian cavalry rendered them a force to be reckoned with. What they lacked in the infantry department, they made up for with cavalry. The satraps deployed four to six thousand Greek hoplite mercenaries in the center rear. Arian's account of the battle places the Greeks even further to the rear. Standing behind the cavalry, they formed a solid spare wall. Behind them, an additional row of infantry stood ready with javelins. As Alexander's army finished deployment, Parmenion understood the Persians held a very strong position and outnumbered them significantly. He advised the young Macedonian king not to attack at this position. If their Greek infantry crossed the Granicus, they would fall victim to the projectiles fired at them before suffering a devastating cavalry charge as they reached the river bank. There are multiple interpretations of what happened next. One alludes to Alexander conceding it was late in the day, setting up camp and secretly crossing the river downstream during nighttime. However, most surviving accounts contest this, claiming Alexander decided to mount a charge nonetheless, feeling he had to attain personal glory. As such, as a trumpet sounded, Alexander and his bodyguard launched the initial charge. They advanced in a great wedge formation against the Persian far left. Their move unnerved the Persian cavalry stationed in the center, which moved to augment its left flank. Alexander plunged into the river with 13 cavalry squadrons. He was now driving into the enemy projectiles towards an area that was sheer and protected by armed men and cavalry, and negotiating a current that swept his men off their feet and pulled them under. His leadership seemed mad clap and senseless rather than prudent. Even so, he persisted with the crossing and after great effort and hardship, made it to the targeted area, which was wet and slippery with mud. He was immediately forced into a disorganized battle and to engage men against men, the enemies who came bearing down on them before the troops making the crossing could get into some sort of formation. The Persians came charging at these with a shout. They lined up their horses against those of the enemy and fought with their lances and then, when the lances were shattered with their swords, a large number close to the king, who stood out because of his shield and the crest on his helmet on each side, of which was a plume striking from its wideness and its size. Alexander received a spear in the joint of his cuirass, but was not wounded. Then the Persian generals Rusakis and Spititrates came at him together. Sidestepping the latter, Alexander managed to strike Rusakis, who was wearing a cuirass, with his spear. But when he shattered this, he resorted to his sword. While the two were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, Spitidrates brought his horse to a halt beside them and swiftly pulling himself up from the animal dealt the king a blow with a barbarian battle axe. He broke off Alexander's crest along with one of the plumes and the helmet only just held out against the blow, the blade of the axe actually touching the top of the king's hair. Spitidrates then began to raise the axe for a second blow but Clytus got there first, running him through with his spear. At the same moment, Rusakis also fell, struck down by a sword blow from Alexander. During the fighting, Parmenion's cavalry also moved forward and launched a charge, only to be followed by the much slower advancing phalanx. Both flanks were now engaged in combat. The Persians fought bravely, but they were ultimately unable to withstand the fierce onslaught of the Macedonians. Despite the ferocity of the Persian attack, Alexander and his troops held their ground, fighting with determination and courage. By now, the Macedonian phalanx had caught up. It held its ground with its rows of tightly packed soldiers holding their long spears at the ready. The Persians tried to break through the phalanx's defenses with the cavalry, but the Macedonians stood firm using their shields and spears to push back the attacking horses. As the day wore on, it became clear that Alexander and his troops were gaining the upper hand. Despite suffering heavy losses, they fought with ferocity and determination driving the Persians back. The Persians lost their commanders and the cavalry succumbed 
to the helpless rout. After several hours of intense fighting, the Persians were forced to retreat. Many of their soldiers were killed or captured, and the remainder fled in disarray. They fled to Miletus, leaving the Greek mercenaries, which were much less mobile than the Persian cavalry, in the field. Alexander's cavalry surrounded the Greek mercenaries. They massacred the helpless infantry. Only 2,000 surrendered. According to Plutarch, the Persians lost 20,000 foot and 2,500 horse. During the entire battle, eight Persian commanders were named among the fallen. Alexander's losses were placed between 34 and 115, although realistically these numbers must have been much higher. When the dust had settled and the last of the Persians had fled, Alexander emerged victorious. In the battle's aftermath, Alexander sent the 2,000 captured Greek mercenaries to Macedonia, where they likely lived out the remainder of their lives as slaves. He purposefully did not incorporate them to make an example of the Greeks who dared to take up arms against his army. The victory at the Granicus was a significant milestone in Alexander's campaign against the Persians. It boosted his reputation as a military leader and helped to establish his dominance over the region. It also set the stage for future battles between the Greeks and the Persians, and it ultimately paved the way for Alexander's eventual conquest of the Persian Empire. The victory allowed him to take control of much of Asia Minor. Mitrines, the Persian commander at Sardis, decided to surrender to Alexander upon learning of the defeat. Other strongholds surrendered as well, providing Alexander with a sound foothold in the region. Asia Minor now lay open to Alexander's mighty army. This victory was only just the beginning. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there is a person, topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in the comments. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and all my channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.